Ladies and gentlemen of the Street Gaming Zedicom video, it might be the New Year's. Happy New Year's, by the way. But there is a lot of movement in the GPU industry and technology industry as a whole. We're going to be focusing primarily on AMD in this particular video because there's been a couple of interesting developments regarding that aforementioned company. So the first one that I want to discuss, the first thing I want to discuss is Polaris. No, it's not a star. Well, it is a star. But AMD have been tweeting about it and discussing it since December, actually. Um... And indeed, even at the RTG Summit in December, tweets from Chris Herc and Rajas Kodori didn't really make much sense. They mentioned it, they said things such as Starry Skies and Sonoma next week should have an excellent view of Polaris. Uh, Polaris is 2.5 brighter to times today than when Ptolemy observed it in 169 AD. And these were comments from the 26th of November last year, 2015, which always feels bloody weird. But more has popped up over the last few days, and it's getting weird. Essentially, we don't know too much, but it appears that Polaris is going to be the evolution of the GCN architecture. So just a quick breakdown if you're not too familiar, the GCN architecture is essentially the architecture that AMD have been putting out on their GPUs since 2011. There have certainly been improvements to it, um, whether they be improvements in tessellation, improvements in memory bandwidth or efficiency of memory bandwidth utilization, increased number of shaders, increased number of ROPs, improvements to the asynchronous compute engines, and blah, 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 blah. The fact of the matter is, essentially, it's still the same architecture. Enter Polaris. So, our guiding light is to power every pixel on every device efficiently. Stars are the most efficient photon generators in our universe. Their efficiency is inspiration for every pixel we create. Introducing the Polaris architecture. That's literally the only image that's popped up regarding this. So all we can do is make some assumptions. Now we know AMD at the moment are have their fingers on a lot of pies. They are of course pushing GPU open, which we've already discussed in depth just a few days ago. They are also pushing other graphics card breakthroughs like high bandwidth memory, high HBM2 of course, a major free sync update, focuses on image quality, which essentially will be widening the colour gamut. They're going to be moving from what they consider to be, I guess you could say, insufficient number of bits per pixel, which is just 8, all the way to 10 bits per pixel. Now, we do already have 10 bit per pixel monitors without question, but they're typically reserved for high-end, really expensive screens. And you're going to be using seeing those on like image artists. You might see them in like Photoshop professionals, video professionals, that type of stuff. They, they certainly are out there, but they're quite expensive. And they're not really what you would associate with the average high-end gaming, you know, setup. So... Let's say, for the sake of argument, your your game is Counter-Strike, you probably won't have a 10-bit per pixel monitor. They just, you know, are not normal. But AMD wanted to fix that, and w one of the reasons they cite that is because they believe that, yes, an inc increased uh, colour gamut will improve things such as alpha channels. It'll mean that shadows and other, you know, bright images, it, it's just going to look a lot more natural. And we're also going to see a lot more consistency in color mapping over various devices as well it should be kind of cool now there is another thing that's popping up at the moment as well regarding amd's hardware so i want to close this bit out regarding polaris unfortunately we don't know if it's a complete evolution of the gcn architecture so we don't know for the sake of argument whether it's going to be from kepler to maxwell or whether it's going to be something more radical we just don't know we have heard many things regarding the next iteration of the architecture also known as arctic island slash greenland also known as radium 400 series also known as pretty much anything at this point because there's so many bloody code names it's hard to keep track of them code names code names code names but anyway um but amd consistently are putting out all of the time that it's going to be at least two times more efficient. So 2.5, this tweet from Rajaj, it, Rajaj, it's possibly, it's possibly accurate. Possibly accurate, 2.5 times. It'd be kind of cool, right? Imagine that. Just imagine that level of performance. 
yeah, that's what excites me in the morning. Well, not just that, but let's not get into that, shall we? Anywho, so there's another series of tweets that have popped up, but I've not had massive amounts of time at the moment to confirm them. I, I will be looking into this more over the next few days. So, essentially, a user by the name of Blue is Violet, um, these tweets have kind of started to circulate, circulate excuse me, around the internet, but they're basically citing a a uh, paper that was authored by Mike Manta. Now he is one of the heads of AMD. He's well, not a head, but he's a corporate fellow. Now, corporate fellow is a pretty lofty title in AMD. It's reserved for the most, I guess you could say, gifted of their engineers. So, essentially, this um, this paper. I can't 100% um, go through the authenticity at the moment. I'm starting to look into it some, but it looks pretty genuine. There's a figure there which is an illustration of summarized APU roadmap from 2013-2016 of AMD's hardware. Now, one of them is pointing out it's HBM2, uh, sorry, HBM embedded memory with 128 gigabytes per second and an Onion 3 bus which is 50 gigabytes per second. It's also pointing to stacked memory HPM with more CUs. Now, this is using the Zen architecture, which is, of course, an evolution of Carizero, uh, and which is in turn an evolution of Kavari, which is an evolution of Trinity from back in 2013. Now, just for your records, if you are familiar whatsoever with the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One architecture, you can pretty much imagine how this is going to play out. So I have covered these in nauseating detail, and I'll try to remember to link them in the uh, article, oh, sorry, in the video description. If if I forget because I'm a chimp, which is possible, you can go to redgamingtech.com and you can search for Xbox One X X. Blah, 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 blah. Oh my god, I cannot speak today. Xbox One SDK and hardware leak. And there's an analysis of CPU, GPU, RAM, and more, part one, Tech Tribunal. Or you could also search for PS4 architecture, Naughty Dog. And there's a hell of a lot of stuff. You can search for part two, and it goes through the actual buses of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. And it's a lot of information there. Probably more than what I could go through in this video. Because honestly, going through all of this again would take quite a long time. But essentially, the onion and garlic buses have been around for some time, um, and so it's just it's just an evolution of that. So, from what we understand, it's going to be fully memory coherent. There's going to be a, a memory coherent interconnect, doubled onion free. It's capable of 50 gigabytes per second. So, as I mentioned, that is an evolution of Carrizo. Now, that chip is itself an improved design of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One and how the both companies, Sony and Microsoft, wanted the hardware to function. The major point, however, is that it's going to have more CUs, more compute units, more graphics engines, more shaders. You might also have picked up on the fact that it's 128 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. Now, this is because it's going to have a single stack of HBM1. So, essentially, it's the maximum amount of bandwidth. One single four high stack of HBM1 memory. And it's kind of weird because the reason I'm a bit confused by this paper is the timings are the weirds. Because, for example... We know that the next generation architecture from AMD, the GPU architecture, HBM, uh, is going to be using HBM2. And from what we understand from what AMD have stated in the past, during their financial analyst day, um, which we've already covered quite in depth, they said that Zen and APU enterprise class products are not coming 2016. Instead, they are stating that they're going to be released in 2017, so a year later. So it's kind of weird in that regard. I'm not stating that it won't happen. I'm not going to say that because we just don't really know. But it's possible that 
it's going to be for a specific purpose. Maybe. Maybe it could be for the ne next Nintendo console. Maybe. Assuming that they're even going to be using AMD hardware. But it's just a bit bizarre, in my opinion. Um, it's not that I'm surprised that AMD are going this route with HBM memory in APUs, because I think anyone <laughs> kind of expected this. It's just kind of like, oh, they're doing it. Well, that's a bit, like, obvious. It's a bit like a store, you know, like a supermarket, suddenly bringing in carrots or something. It's just pretty much part and parcel of what they're going to have to do for business because, you know, they're pushing them in, they're pushing the architecture, and one of the problems with APUs, essentially, is memory bandwidth. Now, of course, GP, uh, GDDR memory you can put in, certainly like the PlayStation 4, but it's just a pain in the ass. Essentially, one of the big problems is just getting the amount of data to the built-in GPUs. Now, there are other issues with APUs, essentially die space and cooling the damn thing, because obviously putting a CPU and a GPU on the same piece of silicon beefs up the amount of power that's required to run it and therefore the amount of heat. But also the other big deal is the memory bandwidth. Now, reducing the die size, which of course is what they're going for next year, 14 or 16 nm, it's still a bit ambiguous. But that ambiguity doesn't really matter, the point being that the size will shrink. It's just kind of weird that they're deciding to go with only one stack of HBM1. One stack of HBM2 I could have dealt with, but it's just a little weird that they're doing this. And of course that would also reduce the amount of memory as well. One gigabyte, maybe? Would that be enough? Two gigabytes? Well, I guess it depends on, once again, the application of the APU. So in other words, what is it really going to be used for? So, I don't know. It, it Really, to be honest, right now, it's all kind of just up in the air. It's kind of cool, though. I must say, I, I really like the ideas that's coming out. And I really like what AMD are doing. Um, I like what... Uh, to be honest, I actually think that in the last year or two, I think generally we as consumers... Whether it's gaming, or whether it's hardware, whether it's technology, or whether it's software, I think we've actually got it pretty damn good. Um, and I don't just mean in terms of the amount of evolution in the market, I mean in terms of the amount of choice. I do bitch sometimes about the CPU market, and I do wish there were some improvements there, particularly from Intel. But just generally speaking, I think we've got it pretty good. And I think 2016 is going to roll in to be the same. I mean, look at the number of games that we've got out. And whether you're an Xbox One game or a PlayStation 4 game or a PC game, there are some really cool pieces of technology which are which are uh, floating around. And the NX, the Nintendo NX, in terms of hardware, it could be an absolute monster. And if there is an evolution of the PlayStation 4's APU, which, to be fair, it could be, it's going to be a pretty, pretty cool system. So it really, the developers won't have any excuses, right? 4K Mario, here we come, I say. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.